body and even if you don't have a body. People who follow this series will have noticed that Gurdjieff is one of those folks I frequently obliquely reference, both because of his influence on my own practice and theory of spirituality, but also because I feel he's significantly underappreciated in our contemporary overlapping liminal communities of folks focused on inner development, transrational spirituality, new religious forms, multidimensional maturation, and the betterment of humanity in the context of the biosphere and the cosmos. That's why I'm thrilled to have Trevor Lucid Cube Stewart here for a discussion about Gurdjieff's famously arcane, difficult, brilliant, surrealistic sci-fi spiritual masterpiece, the tales of Beelzebub to his grandson, as well as anything else he wants to talk about. Hi, Trevor. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with an origin story? When did you come across Beelzebub's tales and what inspired you to actually try to read the damn thing? Well, basically, uh, I had a, you know, in uh, high school, I had uh, a group of buddies and we all were into uh, just reading and exploring philosophy and music and, uh, you know, went through the an evolution from being a drummer in a, punk, you know, being punk band to, you know, getting into avant-garde acid jazz and just kind of went through the whole spectrum. And in the process, we're exploring tons of ideas, reading stuff about Buddhism, Ram Dass, uh, you name it. And there was definitely an esoteric kind of occult tinge to the whole thing that probably came in through some of the music, the darker side of some of the music that we were into. And so, you know, you happen upon characters like Aleister Crowley or Gurdjieff, you know, in our case, Gurdjieff somehow came through because one of our, one of my friends, a friend of a friend, his parents were in the work and the, the work is, is kind of like that, where it's like, if you know someone who knows someone type of thing, because the work doesn't advertise. And so this, just this friend of a friend was into he was getting into uh, Gurdjieff stuff because his parents were in the work. And so that's kind of how Gurdjieff came into our orbit. And so at that time, I would say that, you know, it was sort of like Gurdjieff sort of seemed like a, some kind of badass rock star, you know, rebel of the spiritual world that was sort of like what we saw in music, you know, because music after Gurdjieff sort of went through that process of jazz and then rock and sort of uh, breaking with those norms, which I'm sure was facilitated by, you know, modernism, postmodernism and the arts, but in music that happened later. And so we were under the influence of a lot of music after the, you know, 50s, 60s, whatever. And uh, so a lot of that flavor of rebelliousness uh, that we were into in the music was sort of there, it was available to be perceived in Gurdjieff to a certain extent. So we all kind of, there was this aura of mystery around Gurdjieff that made him seem attractive to us. And I recall my, one of my first exposures to the work was watching, sitting down and watch, pl plugging in a tape of meetings with remarkable men, a movie that was made based off of Gurdjieff's um, second book, uh, second series of books actually, which was his autobiography. And uh, as the tape's going in, uh, my buddy at the time, uh, my roommate, was lighting up a spliff and being like, this is the secret shit, man. This is the secret shit. And then we watched Meetings of the Remarkable Men. And I just remember how, I mean, now it just seems like such a corny movie to me. But the, at the time, it was very under the influence of hashish, you know, and opium and whatever else was going on. Uh, it just lent this whole, uh, you know exotic aura to the whole thing and the movements were striking you know in that film to me it just seemed like clearly there was something going on here that I didn't understand but seemed highly intentional and kind of otherworldly so anyway all that was very intriguing and we were all just reading so many different things we read in search of the miraculous which is one of the most quoted apparently complete expositions of Gurdjieff's method that's available but then we were also, I guess this speaks to the, the perspicacity of the group or the kind of the hardworking <laughs> uh, nature of the group that we were all reading, actually reading Beelzebub's Tales, which is very rare because it's a, this, just a behemoth uh, 
of a, of a text to get through, but we all actually read it. And uh, so that's kind of just a potted history of how I came to it. And of course, things have really evolved since then. I've, I've had other influences, but that's how I came into contact with it. And it was became appealing to me in the first place. That's fabulous. I, it makes complete sense to me that one would evolve a taste for Gurdjieff through acid jazz. You know, there's the, um, the artistic <laughs> and musical nature of it is something that really intrigues me. It was, uh, you know, written and rewritten in Paris in the twenties, which is the same time and place that the surrealist movement was starting, right? It was the kind of moment of history of James Joyce's Finnegan's wake and stuff like that. You know, it's a, uh, it's a very avant-garde piece of art as well as everything else that it is. I mean, if I try to get across to people what it's like, I, you know, it's like Salvador Dali and a bunch of Kabbalist scholars got together to combine Star Trek with the Arabian Nights and the Tibetan Book of the Dead. <laughs> and it has a yeah, I mean, and yeah, and that's that's only one a crazy combination you could use to describe. Yeah, it, you could but do absolutely. so many different things with this. Yeah, and it has this yeah. uh, it has this Zen koan quality, which is like it initially appears impossibly verbose gibberish <laughs> but if you persist in trying to decipher it for yourself uh, through different modes of exploration it becomes increasingly revelatory and comprehensive as a dharma text and it has this amazing element of critiquing the failure modes of past dharma teachers and psychotechnologies how do you um how do you approach orienting people towards benefiting from the text and putting the effort in required to grapple with it I mean, there has to be an, an interest, right? And so in terms of, I don't have a, a sales funnel for it or anything like that, but uh, I, uh, I just kind of keep my eyes out uh, in my own network for people who are, who are already have an established interest in it. And so typically, you know, people in the same way that I, it was, you know, we have whatever our set of influences are. And then if some of those overlap, there's a Venn diagram overlap with any of the Gurdjieff work stuff to, to the extent that it would become interesting to us. And then the, the confusing portions of it then, then would become really interesting. And so if there's people like that, <clears throat> that are just, hey, what is this Gurdjieff, uh, Gurdjieff stuff? What is Beelzebub's tales? Or what are the movements? Or uh, what is the Gurdjieff work? I'm interested in talking to people like that. And mostly I've just, I've been in work groups and um, travel around. So most of the people that I know and work with are in or have been in the Gurdjieff work, uh, some group that's studying the Gurdjieff method in whatever fashion, which there's a number of lineages and a number of approaches. And it's not really one thing, uh, <clears throat> but that's kind of how I've met with people. But in terms of how do I orient them to get benefit from it? Was that, mm -hmm. I think yeah, that was something like that. You said, so, my approach to it is uh, because there are many layers to it, my approach is to, I mean, just first kind of assess where someone's coming from um, because there are, for instance, uh, within the Gurdjieff work, it's not uncommon for the view to be that you're supposed to let it fall on you and just become receptive, that you're supposed, it's more dependent on your, your, the state of your being or the state of your mind and heart being in a certain state in order for it to vibrate something in you and, and teach something to you subconsciously, so to speak. So it's sort of like a magical text in that way. And um, although there is some truth to that, that's the first thing I would try to dig out, you know, mm -hmm. and, and remove from someone's preconceptions about the book. And so I really start with critical thinking of really looking at the text and reading comprehension is really important. You know, it's, it's an incredibly tough uh, text to comprehend. Just, just the literal narrative is hard to put the pieces together. So that's why I started, it's just very basic, very practical, studying the text, verifying reading comprehension, moving into interpretation. And then that does eventually evolve in, into, um, you know, more rarefied or subtle koan-like aspects. And so that's it's kind of the natural progression. And then 
we can recapture some of the magic and the enchantment from the early part of the phase, <clears throat> from, the, from those early misconceptions or preconceptions. And those do come back later, but really like getting down to brass tacks and actually taking an active personal interest in studying the text is the first step. But for many people, <clears throat> you know, there has to be a personal interest there for that to happen. And, and understandably, not everyone is personally interested in Gurdjieff's writings who are in the work, which is fine. Uh, but as far as people outside of the work, they usually won't have that preconception I was talking about, that this is a magical text. They will actually tend to just reject it, right? So instead of kind of accepting it, they'll kind of reject it. And in my view, bo both of those are, are the wrong approach with Gurdjieff, acceptance and rejection. It's got to be uh, a mix, a, you know, there's got to be discrimination getting involved. So if people haven't heard of Gurdjieff's writings and they go and take a look at it and they're like, well, this is just a load of horse shit. This is, th there's nothing here. You know, you read a chapter and you're like, what was that all about? How does that apply to my life? Right. There just appears to be nothing relevant to, to yourself or what's going on. Interesting maybe, but for a lot of people, it doesn't have any, there's no associations with the material that would enliven it for them. So in that case, you know, learning a little bit about the history of Gurdjieff himself, creating some interesting around some interest around him as a historical character is usually how most people get to a place where they then could be interested in his writings. So I might steer the conversation in that direction if, you know, someone was asking me about it. But, uh, you know, so it's like friends I have who are not in the work that's the direction I've learned to go is just kind of telling them more about Gurdjieff as a person and his teaching as a whole. And then if they become interested in looking into any of it, you know, then we can kind of, a lot of what you brought up earlier is, is a really, I mean, the stuff you brought up about the surrealist movement avant-garde is just like dead on. And I think that's, he's probably the most underappreciated art figure of the early 20th century who just, I mean, the, the, just how gargantuan what he produced was at that time. And the way it was influenced by Finnegan's wake and all of that in the work, it's not appreciated how many influence, influences Gurdjieff indeed had from the artists of that period. He was working primarily with artists most of his students were literary people and he was totally influenced by all of that stuff and how he wrote, but he didn't publish anything. He actually only circulated his writings within private groups. And even most of them did not have all of it. He would just like have a chapter read while they were there with him. And that's literally all that they would get. So for people, so it's kind of his own fault in a way, but he didn't publish all of this stuff for many years until after all of those art movements that had influenced what he wrote were already gone or had developed into other things and influenced, you know, blended with other cultural elements. So Beelzebub's Tales wasn't published until 1950, just after he died. And then his other works, Meetings with Remarkable Men and Life is Real Only Then When I Am, were, were published like, I think it was in the late 50s was Meetings with Remarkable Men. And then Life is Real wasn't until I think the 70s even. I'm not sure about those dates, but in other, in other words, a long time elapsed. And so pe people haven't really had the, the opportunity to form those connections. But I think over the long stretch of time, uh, it will become increasingly appreciated how he was influenced by the culture and how he influenced the culture. Um, but so that's, that's kind of like really helpful for contextualizing Gurdjieff uh, so it's not just this kind of uber random thing that's not connected to anything else so that people could become more interested. Yeah, I think that's true. I think the, the contextualization of the project and of the man and, and so much of what's in the text is, is the flavor of this guy, particularly in you know, the opening chapters and the concluding chapters. You get a sense of this character, which is fantastic. And I like what you were saying there about, you know, people not having access to these books, even at the time, as we're in a very different position now to grow up having all of the books at our disposal and being able to read them and situate them historically. 
And there's a question around why it's Beelzebub's Tales to his grandson, because the, you know, the next generation is missing. It's skipped over. And uh, do you think there's a sense in which that title indicates the idea that this message is, is to a future generation and that he expects his immediate pupils not to have access to everything and not to really get it and maybe even to uh, have an anticipatable deviation from what he's trying to say? Well, how did you catch on to that? How did you, it just, you got all that just from the title? Is that... Uh, yeah, what, what you just what you just said right there is as to why it would yeah. be his well, I mean, rather than his you're, son. You're exactly you're exactly right. I mean, Gurdjieff, and this this took a long time for me to understand. Gurdjieff did not intend his pupils to understand his writings. He basically wrote it. He didn't give them any handholds on it. He had them literally promulgating it, or passing it around, or spreading it, and without understanding what they were spreading. And when I got into work groups, I just, you know, I had a prior interest in the writings, but work groups allowed me to have access to the movements. There's inner work exercises or like sittings. Uh, there's music that he left as well. But it became apparent to me because I was studying the writings pretty assiduously on my own and so naturally, I was looking for anything I could to get a, get purchased on this material. And so I would read like Oraj's comments. Some of Gurdjieff's pupils left some commentaries and some things. So I, I scanned all of the literature of his pupils for any information about his writings. And then was comparing that to what I was discovering just by looking directly at his writings for myself. And I just found that there's this complete lack of material, like just... Of, of really insightful material, I should say. Plenty of material, people talking about it, but it was mostly just parroting what other people had said. And it wasn't actually uh, a really just brass, like I said, said before, brass tacks, just looking at the material in and of itself, making comparisons with the material that Gurdjieff left. And so Gurdjieff actually left this kind of jigsaw puzzle, you know, in his writings for any reader to put back together, but it's exceedingly difficult exceedingly difficult to do that, right? That's why no one has done it, or very few people have done it. But essentially, that's right. He, he wrote this stuff, he sent it, he died, sent, you know, published it right before he died, or, or authorized publication, died, understood it would be spreading around and being spread around by his own pupils. And they, they reported the sense that everybody knew he was passing this over them, that this was a javelin into the future. And, and they apparently accepted that, you know, um, he did that, I guess he did it in a manner that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't, uh, you know, I would be offended personally, like, you know, what, what am I just a pawn in your, in your scheme, but that's, that's exactly what he did. Um, and it's, it's even more complicated than that, but basically he was writing to future generations to answer, answer your, your question or, or agree with the point that you were making. Yeah, I was. I'm curious. You mentioned uh, Orage has some commentaries. Um, I know Bennett has some commentaries. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't seem to mention it at all. Uh, you know, Madame de Salzman and Spensky never really touch it as material. Are there, you know, who do you like as a commentator? Like, what have you come across? Well, you like, oh, that's a really good take, or this is a, as a nice way into this material. Yeah. So, I mean, do you want us to, I don't know if people who would be watching this would, should we define who these people are or how, how basic should we start here? Should we just have a conversation? You obviously know who Bennett let's, and Arash are. Let's just have are. a conversation. I, I think, I think they can try to keep up with us. I don't mind if they. Cool. Well, you themselves. can Wikipedia it nowadays. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so the best material, you can, the most useful material you can get on this to help you understand uh, Beelzebub's tales in this case, but Gurdjieff's writings really as a whole, I'll call it all and everything. Really all and everything encompasses, you know, Beelzebub's tales, meetings for black men, life is real only then when I am the three series. So the, the most useful material for understanding all and everything is not commentaries on the material. It's actually really probably the most useful source is in search of the miraculous. Although there's, major problems with it uh, or major gaps, but in search of the miraculous, the exposition of the teaching as a whole, 
the way that he gave it to his students, that's, that's the most useful source I have found. His descriptions of exact, the exact language, he felt that was needed. Um, his descriptions of objective art and how objective art, it's very, it's not really well, it's, there's some misunderstandings and how, Uspensky had some misunderstandings, I feel, of what Gurdjieff meant and, and that come up through in the way that he quoted Gurdjieff. But a lot of the stuff about objective art, uh, language, et cetera, from In Search of the Miraculous is extremely helpful. Another one is the Orajian version. If Have you read the Orajian version or are you familiar with that at all? Yeah, that's from one of Oraj's uh, students trying to recollect what was left behind there. Of Oraj. <clears throat> that has some very useful pieces as well. And then there's a, a book out now called Gurdjieff's Early Talks, I think it's called. It used to be a, a shorter version of it with less content called Views from the Real World is, is another one. But basically, the, all of those are recordings of Gurdjieff's lectures, um, some of which Uspensky used, because you can see Uspensky using the same material in In Search of the Miraculous. Um, that's also super useful. So anywhere where he was sort of laying out and describing the teaching or the method or the process or the experience of going through the process, that's all actually really indirectly helpful for understanding what he's actually trying to facilitate right. with the writings. Because he decided to put his teaching in the form of the writings, you know, in 1924 after his car accident. You know, so it stands to reason that it would contain all of that material he had been teaching. And yet when you read all of that material that's been recorded, but then go read his writings, none of it appears to be there. And of course it's all there. It's just in a veiled form or in a, in a different form. So that's what I found to be the most useful, but as far as commentaries on it or people talking about it, uh, there's really not much. It's going to steer it. In my opinion, it steers people way off course. Uh, no, in you know, bet, <laughs> go go ahead. I was just going to say that I've heard people uh, take different positions on the relationship of Uspensky and In Search of the Miraculous uh, to the material that's in Beelzebub's Tales, where obviously Uspensky put a lot of work in and had a great memory and had a really good way of of synthesizing and clarifying this material, systematizing it in a certain way. But then there's also this concern that so many people come into it through Uspensky, that Uspensky's phrasing and framing colors the way they understand the work. And I'm curious where you see deviations between Uspensky's presentation and what Gurdjieff himself is writing. Well, the, uh, the main, so this would be, so this is another thing that I think was, it's been really helpful to me is the inner exercises and the movements and the music, um, but specifically the movements are, it's in the same way that we didn't, people didn't have Gurdjieff's published works to make a comparison with um, Finnegan, you know, James Joyce's Ulysses and stream of consciousness writing or synthesism or cubism or all these other influences that he had. Uh, and so they couldn't make that comparison and, and see some of the influences or, which would allow them to better understand his writings in the same way the movements are not publicly available for the most part. And there's not a, there's not a movements hall down on your corner, the way there's a, a dojo for, you know, doing a Aikido or something nowadays. Right. So, but there's actually the, the, some movements are symbolic and are constructed on the same principles that his writings are constructed on. But if the material is not there to actually make that comparison, you wouldn't know. But when you work with movements for a period of time, you become familiar with them and then become familiar with the writings, it starts to become apparent that the two are, are talking to each other, that the, they flesh out, the movements fleshes out certain things or gives certain rise to certain insights that then are available when you're reading the writings. So you go, so you kind of know what he's talking to because it was given to you experientially in the movements. And so that's a huge missing piece. That was a huge missing piece for me initially, but I was very fortunate to have access to movements um, and, and to have worked with those for a number of years. So in terms of Uspensky, Uspensky never really, he worked with the movements, but it's very brief him talking about those exercises because 
he was really only exposed to those, I think in Tiflis or Constantinople, like sort of when Gurdjieff was fleeing Russia at, you know, prior to landing in France, Uspensky was only with him a couple of times. He was developing a lot of movements during that time. A lot of the early movements were developed during that time. And so Uspensky really didn't have that material. You know, he had sort of the psychological material, the theoretical material, the philosophical material. And he, we're really lucky that he did what he did, um, as partial as it is. Uh, so I don't, you know, we're always accepting or rejecting things, but Uspensky is very important. And he was very important for Gurdjieff. He, he helped, he was one of the main sources of funding for Gurdjieff and even getting Fontainebleau going. Like he was instrumental for Gurdjieff in so many ways, but he didn't have access to the movements material. And because uh, Gurdjieff was developing that uh, subsequent to them basically splitting for the most part, um, or they weren't in, in regular contact like they were in Russia. So that is the, a lot of the tonality and I would say the tone really of Uspensky really misses, just look at the flavor of Gurdjieff's writings and look at the, the tone and the flavor of Uspensky's version. So he captured Gurdjieff's um, incredible degree of insight and uh, subtlety and clarity but he didn't capture Gurdjieff's heart really in the same way and his social flair and all of those other things. He, he does describe it. You know, if you look up the index and in search of Maxwell's will say Gurdjieff's humor, and you can go find a page where he's saying, Oh, look how humorous Gurdjieff was here. And so there's like, he kind of recognized and, and brought some of those into his character description of Gurdjieff, but it doesn't come through in the flavor of the teaching in the, in the same way. And so it's really in the tone like the underlying tone that it's missing. It, there's other things that are missing too, but it's hard to get into those without getting more into Gurdjieff's, getting more steeped in Gurdjieff's writings or making reference to certain things. But I would say that's the main thing is, yeah, uh, that's and that's true. the main, that's the just, that's the common criticism of, of Uspensky, right? That is overly intellectual. And yeah. so people throw the whole thing out. <laughs> you know, they throw out all this amazing material because it's, uh, you know, overly intellectual, but that's, so that's a fair criticism to a degree, but then you miss, yeah, you know, so much that Gurdjieff left. If, if you can bring in your own emotionality or your own experience to augment what Uspensky left, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, uh, people often don't adequately appreciate what an amazing person Uspensky was. You know, it was strange, interesting life he had and his ability to tune into these ideas and his ability to cognitively capture all those insight structures that were coming across. And it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit hasty to dismiss him because he's lacking some of these other attributes. One thing that stands out when you're talking about tone is the difference in this writing from almost every other kind of spiritual and religious and philosophical writing, right? There's a sense in which people are used to hearing, uh, let's say, religious material, either as dogmatic assertions or as a, as a simplified, benign attempt to get a message across to everyone. If you, you know, you can pick up so many contemporary books and they're very nice, they're very soft, they're trying to put forward helpful principles in a way that people can readily understand. And these books are nothing like that. He's going out of his way to make it difficult and disturbing and off-putting. And a lot of people stand in front of that and go, why would anyone do that? Doesn't he want us to understand? You know, and you can make a very simple argument saying, well, you're not going to value it unless you work for it, uh, which, and there's some truth to that. But beyond that, you know, what do you think motivates this writing style? And, and what's the argument against easily comprehended text? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I mean, you you nailed the the simplest level is just to say, well, if you don't work for it, you won't really have a, a true appreciation of the material. <clears throat> but that that <clears throat> doesn't adequately. So that's true. Um, but really, we have to get into what Gurdjieff understood by or, or was bringing with the idea of objective art. <clears throat> 
which would be an art based on understanding, which and understanding then being, you know, a, a, having the be having knowledge and having being, having a being that corresponds to your knowledge. So you, you know something, but you you it's fully integrated in your life. Like it's it's fully avail that knowledge is fully available and deployable in totally ordinary contexts. It's not context dependent upon having a discussion with somebody. And then you have all these great ideas, but like that actually is there <clears throat> and has been worked out <clears throat> in all its details in ordinary situations, which is incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult for even the simplest idea or simplest truth to actually be fully practiced uh, and, and just a part of one's way of being in ordinary situations, at least in my experience. So uh, objective art is, First of all, Gurdjieff is giving his teaching through art, which I think is awesome. Um, and that's one of the main, I mean, he was putting art and religion together, which is, I don't think an idea totally unique to him. You might be knowledgeable about some other instances of people talking about that, but him taking art and using that as the way to transmit a spiritual understanding is really, really unique. And so objective art was, is basically how, how do, how do, how do you get someone in, in, in transmitting knowledge to somebody? How do you get them to traverse the steps you had to go through? If, if you found, if you were to completely independently discover something for yourself, and now you want to give that to someone else, but you want to ensure that they put to, they use all of the same muscles of interest and curiosity and exploration. There's all of these adjacent qualities and traits associated with the acquisition of that knowledge that is part and parcel of actually deploying that knowledge in real situations. So in transmitting knowledge, how do you get someone to really go through the full bodied process of arriving at that knowledge? And that's what Gurdjieff's art forms his legomenisms are all about is preventing you, keeping you away from the knowledge until it has been verified that you have uh, done everything he would have done to arrive at that knowledge. You have all of the skills available to you that allowed him to come to that piece of knowledge. So he's trying to, he wants to, he wants you to, to ultimately arrive at the same conclusion. He's not different from other people in that way but he wants to ensure that the way that he arrived at that, uh, you're going to arrive there. You're going to go through that process as well. So I'm repeating myself a little bit there, but that's the idea of objective art. And so when we actually get into examples of that in his writings, I mean, I think this is absolutely revolutionary. I think psychologists, neurologists, educators, that, I mean, this, the, what, getting into examples of this in his writings and just how ingenious he is at, at doing this, I, I think is, it's fascinating. It's amazing that nobody knows about it, but partly we don't know about it because it's, it's really fucking hard. Like it's really, really fucking hard because you start out having no idea what he's talking about. And it's this grueling process of performing actions, you don't even know how these actions relate to anything, right? Because you don't have the, the overarching knowledge that contextualizes what you're doing. So it completely prevents knowledge and it's all do, bare doing basically up front. And so that's kind of the idea of objective art and why he didn't give it directly. It's not just, a, oh, you have to work for it so that you appreciate it, but it's actually that you will do all of the things that would allow you to then carry that knowledge out. And so the knowledge is delayed until you've, you're, you're confirmed that you're going to use this, the tool, because knowledge really is just a tool, right? If we have a knowledge of something that gives us a certain amount of power in a situation. And so you, we can talk about like dark psychology, for instance, is kind of like a term. I don't know when that term came up, but you see that now, now that we have all the psychological knowledge well, what is our culture doing with that? The first thing that happens is the commercial, you know, it's, it's used for commercial purposes. And then, uh, you know, AI is brought in, 
how do we, you know, how do we, it's pumped in, you know, they study casinos and use that to develop social media apps that can get, you know, capture your attention. And that's exactly why Gurdjieff buried, because some of this would fall under the category of dark psychology, for instance. Um, Gurdjieff was known to be psychologically manipulative with people. And so he just, I think a lot of it is that, to try to protect people actually from it. But these days, most of this knowledge is available and it's being used uh, for commercial purposes from what I've seen. So anyway, I don't want to get too far off track there, but that's basically in terms of why not just tell you straightforwardly what he's meaning. It's to, it's to ensure you're you're a real person. So by the time you get that information, you're actually going to use it wisely and skillfully. So much of that um, becoming the right kind of person for the insights uh, involves changes that go on in what we would call the unconscious or the subconscious mind. One of the most, I think, interesting framing elements of the book is very early on, he seems to make this a quite explicit claim that we have two different minds, something, you know, a little bit like what we're talking about as left and right brain stuff now contemporarily. But he's saying you've got these two consciousnesses and the one you call the subconscious is the one that I call your real consciousness. And that's a very intriguing claim, especially when you get into things like the message of the book being around this combination of intentional suffering and conscious labor. And you're like, well, but if what he means by conscious is our subconscious, then that puts a slightly different spin on it. And it puts a slightly different spin on what part of me is supposed to be receiving the message. So I'm curious how you think about the role of this text as attempting to communicate to an unseen aspect of ourselves. Yeah. So the, the way I like to, I think a helpful example would be if you go to a physical therapist of ver there's various types of physical therapists, you go to a physical therapist and they've, they have a knowledge of your physiology. They have a knowledge of how, you know, the hip bone is connected to the, the thigh bone and all of that. And they, you know, give you a rubber band and, the, you know, you attach it to your foot, grab it with your hand and pull it 10 times, three reps. And so you do that and I, you don't consciously know what you're doing. Like cognitively, all you know is you're, you're literally only just counting the reps. That's all that's going on consciously. And you may or may not feel even all of the, the inter interrelated parts of the body that are that are going into operation when doing that exercise, it's subconscious, it's below your consciousness. So now you can know and understand how those parts relate and then, you know, devise an exercise based on that understanding. And, and then, so there's a, there's a, the subconscious and the conscious, they have a lot of overlap, a lot of interrelatedness and things can pass from one to the other. Uh, so it's, it's, Inter that's an interesting study, but that's one example of for you as the as the, the patient, it's subconscious. You're consciously doing one thing; it's having another effect that's subconscious. But the physical therapist knows, right? And that's sort of like what's going on with Gurdjieff. He under he knows and understands uh, more about how mechanisms in a human being are connected together. And of course, he's delaying the knowledge of all of that until he's not giving that knowledge to you directly. All he's giving you is a rubber band you have to pull a bunch of times. And through your own sensation of that process, you can arrive at that knowledge and, and come to understand how all that actually works. But um, in terms of speaking to a deeper part, it tends to go into a cha channeling and stuff like that. And then people start hearing the book read and trancing out. And after 40 years of doing that, they still don't, haven't done the most basic cognitive exercises in the book. And those cognitive exercises are the pulling of the rubber band. So what's, what's essential to understand here is that in Gurdjieff's writings, for instance, for instance, Beelzebub's Tales, you're supposed to try to cognitively figure things out. And what's going to be happening during that process 
is that's going to be kicking into gear certain subconscious processes that you may not be aware of. And certainly I wasn't. And, but, but it's more like pulling that you have to pull the, pull the rubber band. Like you have to be engaging something in a way that has, uh, has active engagement that's felt that's a palpable difficulty of some kind. And that's when real subconscious benefits are accrued is from that process. So yes, it's subconscious, but yes, there's also a conscious corollary parallel process. And then the two have um, meeting points. And part of what he's wanting to do is also help us to become aware of the subconscious, which is the subconscious is a, I mean, it's a loaded term, right? There's so many different ways to talk about the subconscious, but that would be an initial stab at that uh, in terms of his writings is I would invite people to look at it more like an exercise where there is something you're doing, but what you think you're doing is actually uh, something else is going on. I can give another little example of that because we kind of know this from like, you know, NLP. I don't know if you have any familiar with NLP, yeah. uh, neurolinguistic programming. Or, you know, all type forms of, I don't really actually know too much about NLP, but there's a lot of psychology where we can talk to each other in such a way that tricks the, a person subconsciously, or we get tricked subconsciously to, um, to, to undergo a certain change. So for instance, if you're talking to a, a psychotherapist uh, and, and I'm saying, you know, I'm in construction. So I say, I am a construction worker they could just through talking with you, get you to, to say, I do construction work. Cause let's say you're, you're, you're having a hard time with retiring from construction work or something. So they could linguistically move you into another pattern of I did construction work. I am a father or something. They could, where they could change the, the way you're talking about it would create different emotional connections to that psychological object, that the idea of, of construction. So they could help you move out of being identified with your career, which you're now leaving, and more into the role of being, being identified with being a father and the things that are connected with that. And that could all just be linguistic changes that they could introduce into your thinking that would then subconsciously change how you're emotionally relating to your identity as a construction worker as a, or as a father. So they could dynamically use the different parts of your psychology to create those subconscious changes through linguistics. So linguistics is one way we can do that. There's lots of other ways to do that. So that'd be an, an, an example, a more psychological example of how you could be consciously engaging in one process, but then there's byproducts that are subconscious that you're not aware of. I don't know if that makes sense. I like the emphasis you were putting on the the need to have the conscious engagement to be pulling the rubber band. Right? There's something similar in uh, in Zen literature around how koans are supposed to be used, where for some people the koan proves that the rational mind cannot provide the answer, and so you're supposed to let that go. But there's another school of thought, particularly associated with Hakuin, who says, no, you have to really try to solve the puzzle. There's no solution, but you have to try hard to solve it. Otherwise, the change doesn't occur, that this device, this gymnasium that's been passed down to us is supposed to enable you to grow, but only if you actually work it. Have you, have you done Zen practice? I have, yes. Okay, yeah, I did. Uh, I've, I've been engaged. I did some, I lived at a Zen monastery for a couple of years mm -hmm. when I was younger. And um, we did koan practice and stuff. And koans, there's a reason there's several hundred koans. Although they're all related fundamentally to a certain transrational space, they also deal with aspects of wisdom around that. They're all different and they have a different, uh, there's a different form of wisdom associated with each koan. And so it's not just, because otherwise you could just open up a, a, a Chinese dictionary and just read that and say, hey, figure that out. But the koans are very, very carefully crafted to, in the same way that Gurdjieff's writings are, to produce 
certain forms of transrational insights that are very, very difficult to get at, very, very subtle. And so the idea that you're exactly right, the idea that you can just fuck off with a koan, the koan helps put front and center that there is a certain action that's needed in your understanding, but that it won't be, it's related to, uh, I guess you'd say transrational, but (laughs) really subtle forms of understanding that aren't also have to do with the sensation of reality or the felt sense of reality. And that's using more of ourselves to, 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 to take reality in than just the mind, but the mind, the mind has it is an aspect of that, but that is a really, there is a koan layer of Gurdjieff's writings and you're, that's a really great, that's an example that I love to use too, the koan, because you have to do something. You're expe- you have to come in there and you have to have an answer, but maybe you can't use words. You have to, you have to show it. You have to demonstrate it another way. And you may not, you may, that demonstration may not even involve any physical action. There may not be anything you say or do, and yet you can still express it. So that's exactly right. And that speaks more to the subtlety of Gurdjieff's movements and writings that it's it's unbelievable. And the move that's what movements are really actually very I think movements are more useful initially in opening that up that layer of cu- human communication up than Gurdjieff's writings potentially. But that does help open that up in the writings as well. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I think Cohen's are a great analogy for it. You know, when I read through this book, uh the question of perception seems uh, front and center to me. You know, at the beginning of the text, there's a critique of human beings of having some automatic mechanism that inhibits us from processing new perceptions properly. And near the end of the text, there's this discussion about um, the reason of knowing and the reason of understanding. And the reason of understanding involves relating to new perceptions differently, taking them in with a different kind of effort and connecting them to other systems in ourselves. So there's a kind of overarching theme about perception and how we take in the world and how we become energized by meaning and encounters with novelty and things like that. What's your, what's your general feeling about the role of the impression food or the, or the centrality of perceiving in a new or more authentic way as, as a basic theme of the text. Whew. Yeah, I, that's... So there's... There's, I guess there's a stepwise, a stepwise relationship between your perception of the book And then also which muscles it's engaging, which muscles of awareness it's engaging. And so our, the percept, your current perception of the material is, is very indicative of what it's, it's a, it's very indicative of, for instance, if you, if you read a a section uh, about him talking about uh, Atlantis or something, and you say, and you, you're like, take that literally. And you don't take that analogically. That will show that in general, in your perceptions of situations, you take them literally. You know, if, if I say something to you, instead of, instead, of, instead of seeing themes in the things that Trevor is saying, you know, across different conversations and starting to get a feel of global aspects of Trevor's heart and mind, from talking to him, you're going to be talking to me. We're just talking about Beelzebub's tales, <laughs> right? But when I'm talking about Beelzebub's tales, you're seeing all of the psychological themes of, of Trevor, you know, that come out in the way that he looks at other situations, because that's how his heart and mind is. So that's a more metaphorical, you know, relationship with the things that people are saying and the, the qualities that are coming through. And so in terms of the perception of the book, there can be a literal perception. There's an interpretation phase where there's 
uh, different views of what the material could mean. And that starts to bring out a more subtle ability to uh, connect the different story. The stories are all interconnected in the book. So it starts to bring out an ability to see themes across different parts of the text. And then that's, at least in my experience, that's when it starts to affect the way you're actually perceive your life to some degree. But then there's also a, a, a layer of where there's a void of perception in a, in, in a intentional kind of way where there's an ability to interpret up to a certain degree and then an inability to know or interpret and then a dialing up and down of those pieces to, to start to get a felt sense of the known and the unknown, which are omnipresent aspects of reality. So then there's more subtle forms of perception that start to come up that have nothing to do with interpretation per se, but um, a more subtle um, sense of things. So perception is key and it's, it's important at different levels. Um, the interpretation phase of the book, I hope I'm explaining this clearly, but the, the interpretation phase of the book is much more psychological. It's much more like perspectives and looking at behavior, what wouldn't today be called behavior chains. Um, you know, a perception of a, a stimulus. What does that make me think of? What does that associate me to? How do I then feel? What do I then do? And so there's those chains running through us, obviously, moment to moment. And those are, there's various chains like that set up in the text uh, to elicit different types of responses. Um, and so the ability to perceive those patterns, to have those in your perception would be a part of this interpretation phase I'm talking about, where there's some kind of understanding associated with the material. <laughs> and then in other cases, as anyone knows who looks at the text, you just, sometimes it's just like, this is, there's nothing here. I don't understand anything about it. He's completely denuded it of any as possible association. And so there's a presence or a, a lack of presence of perception. So it, it, I, I guess what I'm saying in terms of perception in the book, that is the whole, the perception, perception is the core element that the book is working with. But that perception goes through many, many different le levels and many different levels of reality actually. And uh, so it's, it's, it's key, you know, I mean, if you have to have an interest in perception, but I guess maybe a, an adjacent word that's helpful too is also awareness because we perceive based on um, there are different levels of awareness that can be perceived from. So uh, that's relevant to perception. So perception is, could be a launching board to talk about so many different things um, but in terms of the most practical, the book is dealing a lot with our perception of ourselves and other people and how to get more, more skillful at, at that, better at interpreting that. So Gurdjieff being like, are you taking me literally here? You shouldn't. Are you taking me literally here? You should. Are you taking me literally here? Well, you should a little bit to this degree and not beyond that. And so you start to get create a, a, a much greater sensitivity, sensibility of perception are his words. And so that's the, the perceptiveness is obviously a, it's like a tool. It's like a sharp tool that can be sharpened. And that's what, that's what the text is all about is sharpening that tool. At the, uh, that's, you know, for people who haven't engaged this text, that the simplest factual plot level, this is the story of, of, of the devil has been banished to Mars with his extended family, where he's got a fancy telescope and he's been engaging with the earth over the history of the development of the human species. And now he's been called back because he's matured enough and repented enough to return to God at the center of the galaxy. And while they're journeying on this starship, he is taking responsibility for his for the education of the young devil that is his grandson and he's doing that educating in the form of recounting the tales of his adventures with the earthlings now that brings up for me the question of education because we face so many 
crises now converging as a species that if we get the education question right, maybe we can solve these crises. And if we don't get the education question right, basically nothing we do will solve any of our human problems. What do you think? I mean, this is too big a question, obviously, but what's the what's the core educational philosophy that Beelzebub is templating, you know, in his relationships with Hussein, in taking on the role of educator? What is he showing us about how education can be done or should be done? And you're talking about children. Yeah, primarily, but as K but through 12 children as like the foreground version of education that shows us the principles uh, for all of our ongoing education. Okay. Yeah. I mean, some, some of the, the just to hit a couple of maybe broad uh, points would be um, what we talked about earlier, uh, not giving knowledge for free mm. and also developing knowledge developing the intellect in relationship to understanding oneself and understanding other people. Gurdjieff, it's a common misconception in the work or in in terms of people's understanding Gurdjieff was that he was anti-intellectual or, uh, you know, in, in, in his writings, he'll, he basically lambasts every category you can come up with, whether it's scientists or religious people, but basically, um, anyone engaged in in an intellectual or academic pursuit. Um, And he wasn't actually anti-intellectual. I think what he was lamenting was just the development of the intellect. You know, we're developing it to understand, you know, a person can develop their intellect and study, you know, engineering or something, and that's great and potentially useful. But then they can go home and just collapse at the side of a stack of dishes, you know, like, what does that say about that person as a being? What, I mean, what does that say about that person as a being? So, you know, so like in terms of education, that's his concern is the, the, the day-to-day activities and interactions we have are exactly as detailed as engineering. They're exactly as subtle and compl- un- complex. Like experts who study emotion, for instance, though they, they know that emotions are very, very complex. But how does the, for the, we have to come up with a way to educate our society broadly where we, we don't all have to become experts in something, right? Like we have to have an education system where we apply, we develop wisdom and complex thinking, but that we're actually able to apply it to the things that each of us is going to be inevitably doing, you know, that's generalizable to all of our situations. And, you know, anyone who thinks that we, you know, there's also kind of like an idea that we just need to get away from intellectual stuff and it was better when we all lived back out in the woods and there wasn't any problems. It's like, okay, go live in the woods then. See ya. But right now you're saying that and you're sitting on your sofa, you know, and we need people to be studying bird diseases intellectually, like, right. We need to be studying bird diseases. The birds are dying off. Like we need to be studying the ocean and our effect on the ocean. That is an intellectual and should be an intellectual enterprise right? So we need that stuff. Like when I get cancer and I go to the radiologist who has radiology because someone spent the time on abstract math and created calculus, like that abstract math, which is purely theoretical, later becomes extremely practical. So there can be a delay between the theoretical and the practical, but they're totally related. But in terms of education and how we and how we we function, it wasn't that he didn't think, uh, you know, intellectual development and the education system was was needed, but just that in the education system, uh, it needs to be more full bodied. So for instance, I'm totally on board. I think he would have been on board with this. I'm totally on board with people who say the kids should be doing the cooking and the cleaning in our schools and they should be building the schools. You know, they should be doing the additions, you know, 
uh, they should be engaged in keeping up after those places. You know, by the time they're out of high school, they should be able to change a tire on a car, you know, and, and, you know, so I think there could be a more three centered approach to education, I'm sure, uh, to, to bring it back around, just probably more three centered education, um, but also intellectual development. It's just, he, he, I think he felt that we weren't, we were, we were definitely leaving the emotions behind, um, would be maybe a core criticism of education. What do you think about that? I would agree. I mean, I think, uh, He's trying to evoke a more harmonized and generalized uh, assimilation of information. There's definitely a sense in which the modern civilization is not providing adequate heart education. But this book is also, I think to your point, it's full of examples of people whose lives are devoted to scientific and intellectual inquiry. Right to people who are just passionate, lifelong researchers into even small little intellectual questions about how music operates or how electricity operates or things like that. So it's it's full of examples, um, very uh, very laudable examples of people whose embodied and emotional wisdom is committed in their lives to some kind of speculative but possibly useful down the road deep intellectual enterprise. So it seems to me that that's uh, really something that the text champions. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm curious how you think about how all, the, how all of this stands in relation to ecology. Because I think one of the most, I mean, I, I think a lot about a kind of shamanic flavor necessary to spirituality, meaning that whatever kind of developmental life we're leading, it's got to be embodied. It's got to take non-human intelligences into account. It's got to be embedded in our ecology, things like that, that we associate with the figure of the shaman. But this, um, the Grigefian approach, particularly as articulated in this book, um, places individual development very closely entwined with ecological needs, right? That we're producing some sorts of higher qualities that are needed for our own uh, authentic development, but also needed by the environment as a whole so that the inner work, the inner life of the human being can't be dissociated from the needs of nature. And I think that's a really powerful way of thinking uh, given the difficulties our species is having managing an ecosystem at the moment. So I'm curious, uh, what your sense is of the the way that ecology and ecological concern penetrates the text and penetrates Gurdjieff's thinking in general? Yeah, I think you you really captured it really well there. That it, Gurdjieff was um, thinking, uh, you, you know, some would say recklessly about you know what is our what's our role, you know, not only, I mean, there's ecologically, but he was thinking about the ecology in relationship to the solar system and the universe. And a lot of that was actually not literal and was, uh, uh, he understood that we don't know how that works, but he still broached the topic. Um, you know, like we, we have a relationship to the universe, like life on earth is here for a reason and we don't understand what it is, but it's much bigger than we think that it is. And it's much more important than we understand that it is. And it's relating to non-terrestrial life in a way that we may not, and we may not understand, you know, we really don't know why we're here. And it's, it's clear that it's not accidental. Like, what could be more clear? It is incredibly complex and intelligent, right? And we're this, as, as much as we're having an oversized effect on ecology, we're a tiny part of it, um, really. So, I mean, he definitely brings, comes up, that, that topic is broached. Uh, it doesn't, you know, because of the time period when he was living, it doesn't have the his teaching doesn't really have kind of a commitment to environmental sustainability or uh, 
some of those things that we we might insert into that today right so it's it's probably for for an environmentalist uh, it's probably lacking in some of that but but he's really thinking big picture like why are we here and and what is this for but in terms of really you're talking more about ecology and how we relate to the ecology as a species and I don't, I don't know that I have a good answer for the Gurdjieff work and how it, I think that's actually probably one of its uh, deficiencies. Really, is it's it because it was created back in the you know early 1900s. I don't know that it really has. I don't know that I would look to the work or the Gurdjieff ideas to try to determine how I should think about my role, the role of my society in relationship to the Earth's ecology today. Um, I would probably look to other sources, but in terms of how we um, understand it in a much broader picture, in terms of consciousness and the role of life to consciousness, which is like non-physical consciousness, that then becomes, it does have something to say about that. But uh, yeah, man, I, uh, that's as far as I can take it. But I think I think you did point out in the way that you asked that question that there is at least some some thoughts about that we're related to life on the planet and the planet as a whole. And that was not a totally unique idea at the time. The Russian cosmist school. I don't know. Are you familiar with the cosmists? Not very much. No. OK, well, uh, the Russian cosmists were I don't have the full scoop on this. But they were, uh, I think one was Soloviev. There were some philosophers in Russia at the time who were theorizing about the Earth's relationship to the solar system or the sun as a conscious entity and thinking very big picture solar system level stuff and creating a lot of theories around that. That's why they're called the cosmists. And they led directly to the Russian government's develop a development of their space program actually. But it was a short-lived school, kind of went underground for a while. And it, it is coming back into cultural prominence a little bit in terms of modern Russian spirituality and, and cosmology. Yeah, but uh, Gurdjieff actually was influenced by that school, is my point. Um, I think what you're saying is correct. There's not a lot of material, but there are some seeds of material that we can get from some of the deepest thinkers of that time period that might inform the way we think about it now. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with Rupert Sheldrake. And so he wanted to talk about his current feelings that the sun is kind of a conscious entity and that all self-organizing systems have some kind of intentionality and subjectivity. And he thinks that's scientifically valid. But part of the conversation we had was around, if that's the case, then the biosphere of the earth evolves inside the entity that is the heliosphere. And then the human capacity to be a self-organizing system evolves inside the biosphere, inside the heliosphere, so that we may be very deeply adapted to play a role in these systems. And I think the key thing for me, ecologically in the text, is just that idea that we should think about our inner life and our inner development as being entwined with and playing a role in these systems that we're a part of, rather than thinking of ourselves as coming apart from systems to work on our spirituality or existential development or something like that. We face a lot of problems that come from our thinking of those as alternatives rather than thinking of them as deeply intertwined, compatible processes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the safest route is, uh, you know, lo as low impact as we can have as possible because we really don't know how it all works and we really don't know how that cosmic scheme fits together. So, you know, the best thing we can do is just don't fuck with shit. Like just, just like let it go, <laughs> you know, as much as we can. And there's always the other perspective, of course, that probably everything's happening exactly the way it's supposed to, we we're, we we're, we're typically look at things where the ecological discussion is suffused with our own 
wish to survive as a species, right? And for all we know, this is what it's supposed to do. Like you get this growth of this weird mammalian thing with this like appendage on its face and things hanging off the sides and they're all going around fucking and eating and, you know, pillaging and doing these things. And then they create this civilization and then there's, it starts to organize materials on the planet in a certain way. And then they blow themselves up with nukes and blow the planet up. Well, stars explode. Maybe that's a natural, you know, stars have a, a process by which they eventually explode, implode or explode, right? And it may be that you have planets where there's some film of life in a species that develops nukes, and then it blows the whole place up and scatters stuff around. That could be a part of a cosmic process. Yeah. We have no idea how it works. And it's so alien to our to human psychology, to, to the human need to survive and stuff that we just couldn't even possibly get outside of ourselves enough to see how that related to everything else, right? We're part of such a big picture. We really don't know what, what the end result yeah. of all of this is and what is good or isn't good. I just know I don't want my children to get burned up in, in, a, in a nuclear conflagration. Like, I don't want that to happen. Right. But we don't ultimately know why we're here and what we're doing and what we're a part of. And there are vast intelligences in, involved. And in, as we can see, looking how big things are. <laughs> so so I just I, I think that we we really don't know what's going on. Yeah. But I, I just at the end of all of that, I land back in this bucket of like, let's try to preserve things and survive you know, and go populate other planets, right? Like that's where I'm going to go. But uh, we just have a very hard time getting outside of me as a human being, right? And I think that's where the transrational and, and actual ex personal experience of consciousness outside of being a human being is helpful to start to understand this. This is a, we are a particular form that comes into being but as part of a big universe a really really big place that has intentions and modalities and forms of life that we non-physical forms of life that are very very different from being a human being a human is a very small part of the universe right and so I think that's where having some experience of, you know, different states of awareness or different states of consciousness can help to start to understand, you know, we really are a part of something. We don't know what it is and something else is directing all of this at the end of the day. Yeah. I liked um, what you were doing with playing off the notion of whether things are going astray or not going astray in these big processes. I think it's very useful to be able to take both of those points of view and see what they can tell us. But I think that leads me to a question around the role of things going the proper way in this text, because one of the really interesting things about Beelzebub's Tales is how how hard it leans into error-driven development. It has this sense where um, things are not necessarily perfect or well-run, that uh, God designs a universe, and then time and entropy destroyed. He's got to build a whole new universe where there's mutually adjusting factors to complete that. The angels botch the organization of the earth at the beginning. Right? There's this whole sense in which things are constantly being screwed up. <laughs> Uh, and they're not necessarily right the first time, and they don't necessarily go the way they should, and we have to recognize that and deal with it. What's your take on the role that that error plays in this? Because that makes it very different than almost any other religious or developmental document I've come across. Yeah, absolutely. And I, so we have to remember what time period this was written in, and and the the religious nature of people back in the twenties and when Gurdjieff was writing this, and what effect you know, he, he thought that this would have, how this would be perceived. So, cause you're, you're jumping rightly so 
you're able to just look right at that and be like, uh, you know, this, hey, this God is screwing up and these angels are screw ups and all of that. But that is not actually apparent to everybody who reads the book, actually, to most people who read the book the first time. They don't get, they don't, this, we get back into perception. So there's, there are oftentimes misperceptions of characters as being good and in control who on closer scrutiny are not in control or who are screwing up. So if you work with a broad, uh, and I don't know what your experience is with, with working with other people with the text, but oftentimes on a first read, those insinuations don't come through to people. And I, I think that that's intentional on Gurdjieff's part. So there's a setting up of a hierarchy and a God and an almost quasi Christian, not exactly Christian, but kind of a Christian situation in terms of having a God and a, and, and a, a banished devil, but kind of having a God at the center of things for many people that will be taken somewhat literally on the first read and perhaps forever. And where they kind of come from a Christian background, come into the work and kind of adopt the work cosmology in an almost literal sense, which seems absurd, right? But but that's kind of what, what happens. So there's my point being that everything you just discussed there creates a kind of misperception or a miscalculation in the perceptions of readers on an initial pass. Does that make sense? Sure. And I don't know if you've seen that with people at all, but um, many of these characters, when you kind of look at the details of their stories, have you'll find that they have multiple, there's, there's an inference that they're good, an inference that they're bad, and then inferences for different combinations of those elements for mixed motives, mixed intentions, mixed outcomes. So he start, sort of starts you out will have a tendency to fall on one or the other side. There's characters who are like Ashiata that are good characters, characters like Lynch or Hamsanine, who destroys Ashiata's teaching, who are clearly bad, right? Clearly bad characters. But when you actually get down into the, really the nitty gritty details of their stories, it becomes less, much less clear. So what you're saying about, the reason I'm bringing all that up is, <laughs> You're, you're very perceptive. So you went right to a correct understanding, but I'm kind of going back a step to sort of look at why is he setting this up? Why is he setting up a, a religious cosmology, but then all these implications that it shouldn't be taken seriously. And that sort of reflects the fact that he was talking to Christians. Mostly he was talking to a Christian West who had a religious cosmology but weren't imbuing, but didn't have kind of the psychological understanding that would allow them to de-anthropomorphize that cosmology or deconstruct that cosmology. They were sort of uh, had taken over their worldview. And so by taking a religious cosmology, which roughly reflects the cosmology of the culture he was talking to, and then injecting psychological sort of the psychological look at these characters and how that, you know, you start to get a sense of the character and well, this angel's not such an angel. And, you know, this, this uh, divine person is not so divine. He was kind of simulating the process, I think, in his writings by which a person would overturn their own cultural preconceptions about the world, specifically in that case, a, a Christian religious one. And so that's why I think he uses that Christian angelic, sort of hierarchy thing is to make this commentary on Western Christian religions in a way that a Christian could be debugged potentially to show the debugging process for Christians, but also for non-Christians or secular folks. I don't know, maybe you're a Christian, but for people like us today who are relatively secular, we can easily look at those things and not take them seriously. But for Christians back then, man, a, a devil, Beelzebub's tales to his grandson. I mean, that's like, I mean, this was like really provocative stuff. And, a, you know, a God who doesn't foresee all the outcomes, you know, I mean, he's poking all kinds of holes into the Christian. So that's one element of it. So I'll just leave it there before going on.
I hope I didn't stray too far away from your question, but that's one aspect of it. He's, he's talking about how are we going to debug the West of this, this crazy Christian worldview that's taken over um, and, and start to bring in, in his case, bringing in some of these Eastern understandings about awakening and, and bring that into the culture. And I think we're still reason it's still relevant because we're still in that conversation today. We're like, how are we going to move on? We don't have the religions anymore. You know, most people are not religious now. And yet there's this cultural void. And so the work does kind of step into that where it does give religious forms that aren't religious, practice forms that aren't dogmatic, and it, it starts to suggest those, suggest alternatives of uh, ways of practicing without some of those worldviews. So anyway, I don't know if that's, uh, you can let me know yeah, what you think uh, about that. All we can do is, is touch on one facet of each of these things in the bit of time we have together. Right. Um, there's a, a question about the role of, I mean, the role of spiritual teachers is, is debated and contested in various ways, right? It's obviously very standard for human beings to, uh, if they're seekers, if they're outliers, if they want to develop and change, they find someone who impresses them and they join with a few others to create a local field of practice and assimilation around that person. So it works fairly well in a lot of cases, but it's also got some problems around, first of all, that person dies. <laughs> uh, second of all, there's all kinds of overt and covert power and social dynamics in that situation, which can undermine the process of assimilation and learning and practice. So when it comes to, the, I mean, this opens up as I was talking with Jill Nephew about, right? The, the work on this, the inquire function in the app is to see in part to what degree can you create a, an artifact that does a lot of this for us. And in some ways, Gurdjieff is trying to do that with this text as he starts to understand that he's not going to be around to guide people's uh, development. He's going to see how much of it he can put into a text. So to what degree do you think he was successful? And to what degree can this book itself operate kind of adequately as a teacher or Dharma source? Or to what degree can it not really do that? And will always have to be supplemented by finding people who have more knowledge or being or can point things out to you. Yeah, that's great. You, you nailed it once again. Um, so the well, the brilliant thing that Gurdjieff did is he, he, he did, he put himself into a series of writings and the writings are mathematically constructed to release information as you put the pieces together, basically. So just like in a mystery novel, you know, the, the author jealously guards, you know, the, or they, they, they release information in a predetermined manner and then connect that together for you at the end of the book, you know, so like the, the blood on the car seat, the, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, su such and such showed up drunk to the party, like all these anomalies that are set up during the story all come together and make sense at the end, you know, they, they're all connected and become logically coherent at the end of the story. So in the same way, the book is set up so that things are fragmented and then they can be connected back together and then it becomes increasingly coherent actually, uh, despite how, so it looks incoherent when you're first studying it, but it becomes coherent later. But what in that process, what he's able to do is stay one step ahead of us as the, as the student, basically in this case, and test us with the material. If we expose ourselves to it, he tests us. And if we pass the test, he gives us more information, exercises, understandings, all sorts of things, and then leads us down a path. And so I think this is actually the first, and it's done in a very systematic way, but a very organically systematic way. We can talk about how math can, there's very organic systems of math that are nonetheless, there's, just, there's a few basic systematic formula you can use to, to organize really would you say just kind of organic expressions of those basic rules, right? That's what algorithms are often doing. And I'm not a mathematician, but that's just kind of my sense of it. And so that's what Gurdjieff has done really with his writings is he's created an AI. It's the first AI where the AI 
is you're working with something that's not human, that's artificial in a certain sense, and you're getting exactly the same dynamic, interpersonal led process. And it's set up in such a way that it could incorporate many different types of people, people from Christian background, people from secular background. And there's many different starting points on this web, and they all gradually lead back towards the center, basically. So I think he actually understood and prefigures what will happen with artificial intelligence and human beings. We will create these systems that mold and shape us, uh, mold and shape us that in that way, that there's not a human on the other side of that. It's a mathematical program that has all of these core rules and elements um, based on an understanding of human psychology. And on other things, that that's exactly what Gurdjieff did. It's like, I mean, it's 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 hard to under it's it's impossible to overstate just how important and relevant that that is. That Gurdjieff gave an example that could be used today to create an artificial intelligence that combined neurology, psychology, the neurology of awakening would be the key one, in this case, the neurology of awakening. Once we study meditators, study states, and get broad, big data on millions of people undergoing those processes, we'll have an artificial intelligence, in theory, that could monitor the brains of people in a cross-reference, you know, a, a psychological database and provide lessons and tasks and things in a way that no individual human being ever could to assist in the process of awakening. I personally, I think that's our, our one big shot to awaken as a species, honestly, is to harness artificial intelligence for that end before it goes to a different end, right? Um, so that's exactly what Gurdjieff did. And I think he's successful at that. Then we, we of course, have the... Uh, the, the issue that, that that potential is there, but you know, again, without people like you and I contextualizing it and telling other people about it, people, you know, no one's going to become interested in it. Like who's going to go, I didn't just go down to the library and pick it off the shelf and then just become, you know, it's like my friends kind of thought it was cool at the time and it was connected to this other thing I kind of knew about. So it does, I think it does require supplementing uh, for sure, it requires supplementation, but it also stands completely on its own in terms of doing something completely singular that I think is totally relevant. And uh, I just, whether we'll, we would have the human resources to actually study, understand, actualize that process for ourselves, and then communicate that to scientists and other people working on this problem of AI and awakening, which I've just brought up. That's another question. But I think ultimately that is the most relevant for today. That's the relevant thing that Gurdjieff did that I think nobody knows about. Wow. This book is, let's say, famously full of uh, multi-language neologisms that he invents uh, to sometimes make uh, familiar things seem strange to us and sometimes to name a thing that's very subtle or very complex that we don't have a conventional word for. Just sort of for fun, what are some of your favorite of the strange words he makes up, whether it's the meaning or whether it's just the fun of trying to articulate them? <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite ones. That's hard to say. You know, I, I like Aleko Palmecti's son. <laughs> I like the Martian language. I think it's cute. Uh, I like the, the language of the ravens. Because it, one way to look at the, to, to kind of spice it up a little, the neologisms up a little bit, you can think of the raven language, like Gornahor Harhark is the name of one of the characters. Well, the raven language you could look at as, um, what do you call it? There's a word for this, but basically a word that's supposed to cause you to, to create the sound. The onomatopoeia. Something. Onomatopoeia. Exactly. So instead of saying just Gornahor Harhark, you could say, Go to horn, ha ha! We're like like a raven, right? Like you would make the sound of a of a crow or a raven when pronouncing any of those words that you come across in the text. 
So as you're reading the text out loud, that makes it much funnier. That makes it much more theatrical and much more engaging. Uh, and then you get to, it's then revealing, well, I don't want to get into that. But there's all these, th- these, there's ways of engaging in the text that really bring out personal qualities or inhibitions, or just like if you go, people go to theater classes, right? Just to overcome certain things or ex- experience themselves or learn how to use different tones of voices. And that's kind of in the text too, if you become more playful with some of the elephants, well, how would I say this? And then you, if you treat them like onomatopoeias, that starts to become much more fun. Um, there's other examples of it. There, those are, the neologisms are endlessly funny and amusing if you become creative with them. So that, that might be an example of something I found, you know, pretty, pretty funny in my groups to basically have people say it in that way and read it in that way. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any favorite ones or is that, I imagine you're, you're asking the questions. So there must be some that you particularly yeah, I mean, relish. It shifts over the years, which ones. I, I love to say Harnel me Atznel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just uh, funny. There's something about the intonation of some of them. It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, and to guess, and there's different ways to try to utter them, <laughs> and they open up different feelings about as, what an interesting guy in terms of his relationship to language, having traveled in so many places and known so many languages and also having such a strong, you know, philological critique of how language is deployed. So I love playing with these words partly as a way of feeling like I empathize with a piece of his, of the way he sees into language. Yeah, I mean, this is just a whole nother thing. A whole nother, yeah. I mean, this is like a years, years of study and like philologists would be interested in this, you know, linguists would be interested in this, but it's, it's so integrated with so many other knowledge domains that even getting access to that is, is very, very challenging, but yeah, it's, it's they're wonderful. You know? There's so much here. Maybe this might turn out to be part one of a conversation. <laughs> yeah, man, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to continue the conversation at some point. It's been, yeah, fun. This is you're, you're extremely knowledgeable. You, you've obviously been looking into this for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's come and gone in and out of my life for a long time, but uh, I've definitely I've chewed on it quite a bit. Well, I'd love to at some point, whether in a conversation on your podcast or otherwise to hear more about, I'd love to hear more about your background with this and how it relates to other things so but anyway you just you piqued my interest uh because it's rare that i talk to people who have thought about it to this depth so i really appreciate that you know in the conversation yeah, i was going to say the same thing about you i appreciate the so thoughtful so rich and complex and fresh and lively the way that you're engaging with it and discussing it and describing it which uh is just really rare i think and admirable and so this has been a fantastic Uh, nourishing conversation for me. Thank you, Trevor. Yeah, me as well, man. I really appreciate it. 